grateful to us that we cannot ever give back all the blessings that he's given. And th- I, I want to tell you, as we go into this passion time, this time of resurrection, this time of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he just speaks so much of his love and how much that he has given to us and for us. Amen. I, I, I want to preach to you a message as we lead up into the crucifixion and then ultimately on Resurrection Sunday, we will see the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I want to get you there first. Amen. I, I want you to know where it is that Jesus has come from. And we're going to pick it up on a Thursday evening, the Thursday before the crucifixion. And we're going to go into and, and I'm going to ask you the greatest question that anyone will ever ask you. But what is that question? Matthew chapter number uh, 10, verse number 22 says this, You shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Jesus is telling his disciples that if you do what I want you to do, men will hate you. And he says this in John chapter number 14, verse number 6. He said, I am the way and the truth. You know, the truth is something that everyone says they want, but not very many people really want. Amen? It's been said this a long time ago that truth sounds like hate for those who hate the truth. Amen. And, and I couldn't say it any better you don't have to uh, than the this. Question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Can you handle the truth? Can you this morning handle the truth that Jesus Christ has laid before you? And I want to ask you a question. What is truth? Before we get there, I must read just a few verses of Scripture. And remember that this is in Jerusalem. It is on the Temple Mount and in the complexes of Herod, of Caiaphas, and of Pontius Pilate. And we're going to get there. John chapter number 18. I hope you've already got your place in God's Scripture. But I want to start back in verse number 28. And I'm going to read just a few passages of Scripture. John chapter number 18, verse number 28 says this. It says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might be able to eat the Passover. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bringeth you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. And it says, Then said Pilate unto them, Take you him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said to Pilate, It is not legal for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which was spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered again into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, saying, Thou sayest, This thing of thyself, or did others tell it unto thee of me? And the Bible tells us this in verse 35. Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priest have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If any kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Pilate, verse number 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end I was born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Then Pilate said, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again and unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find no fault at all, but you have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, Jesus, but give us Barabbas. I want to preach to you a message this morning. What is truth? What is truth? And there is only three primary kinds of truth, and, and I want you to get this. Number one kind of truth is the truth when you are someone who desires the truth. You want something to be true so badly that you will believe anything. 
you want to believe that whoever it is, maybe this uh, girl or a guy, and you want to believe that all the red flags and all the uh, trouble, all the things are not really true, but you want to believe it because you want to believe that they are true to you because you desire it so much, that you so, so want something. Have you ever just so wanted something? Why, every one of us has grown up um, just desiring the truth of Santa Claus. We want it so bad, right? Amen, Chad? There was a time, just a small time, a short time, that maybe you believed in the big God coming down the chimney. You know why? That is a desirable truth because we want the toys, right, Rayleigh? We love toys. We love gifts. We love presents. So, therefore, we didn't have to have facts. All we wanted to do was have a feeling and desire that it was so true. And that's kind of what we do in life. We desire things to be true. I've seen people that are unequally yoked in in relationships. And one or the other will desire this person, the other person, so badly that they will look past all the facts. They will look past all the reason. They will look past everything. And headlong they will go because they have committed themselves to a desirable truth. There's a second kind of truth, and that is a relative truth. A relative truth is one to where the culture tells us it's okay. The culture has evolved. The culture has come, and and the culture has said that this is right and, and that it's okay and that everything's good to go. And we, as a relative truth, we believe that truth because it's desirable to us And so, therefore, if the culture says it's okay to do, then it must be okay to do, right? Let me give you some examples of a cultural relative truth. Abortion is a cultural truth, a relative truth. Uh, In fact, if you lined up 100 people, 70 of, of those people will tell you that there's nothing wrong with abortion. Amen? They have been, they have a desirable truth. Because their desirable truth is relative because it frees them up to live a a very uh, promiscuous lifestyle. They can uh, go from relationship to relationship, from bed to bed. So a desirable truth becomes a relative truth, but that does not make it a truth. And and let me give you another one. You know, I, I, I hear it all the time. We're coming up on 420. Everybody wants to smoke dope, right? Everybody wants to smoke dope. Back in the 50s and 60s, 70s, 80s, I mean, you, you could go to jail now uh, back then too if you smoked a doobie. Amen. If you hung out with Mary J, you face would be like, yeah, I'm on. But as culture ha- has evolved, now all of a sudden, the vice president of the United States two days ago sat down around a round table which, uh, with a bunch of hippies and said, hey, this is a truth. That marijuana doesn't bother anybody, it doesn't hurt anybody, it doesn't do anything. And, and, and man, I'm, what happened? You know, and, and before the 1960s, it was the devil's weed, right? And now you've got a presidential campaign being built on the fact that if you elect me, I will make sure that marijuana is legal in all states. Cultural relative truth, because it is a desirable truth. Amen? One more, as we'll crown on the limb, but let me say this. A desirable relative truth is how we deal with the issue of homosexuality. Amen? Irregardless of the facts, irregardless of the genetics, irregardless of of the uh, microbiology, any of those things, we have developed a desirable truth to have a relative truth that says that these counter- lifestyles are now mainstream, and those who do not hold that perspective are homophobic, who hate, and who are pushing out a section of people. And that's what we hear all the time. It's preached in in some churches. It's taught in every school. It is a societal thing that is trying to believe in a relative truth because it's a desirable truth. But there's only one truth. And that is the absolute truth. The absolute truth of Jesus Christ. And we're going to answer the question that Pilate asked, what is truth? What is truth? You ready? Got your Bibles open? Here we go. What is truth? Truth number one is a bunch of polluted ordinances. 
I want you to look in verse number 28. In verse number 28, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the Romans, everybody has a desirable truth that they are trying to bring to the situation. The situation is that Jesus Christ has claimed that he is God, that he is the Lamb, and that only through him can you enter into heaven. That's the absolute truth. But they have a desirable truth that through the law and through the ordinances and through all these things that they can work their ways into heaven. And so, therefore, a desirable truth is one of polluted ordinances. Amen? Look what it says. I, I, I have it on the screen. <clears throat> John 18, 28 says this, And then they led Jesus away from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment. And it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Look at that bottom part. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the people of Jerusalem was not worried about meeting God. They were worried about missing a meal. Amen? Look at the bottom again. It says this. And said they led him into the judgment hall, but they didn't go in there because they had polluted ordinances that said they couldn't go into a, a mixed uh, colonnade, that they couldn't go in to Pilate's judgment hall, that they couldn't associate with this mock trial, that they couldn't defile themselves. And so they were living this lie of desirable truth this cultural relativism that said that the law said that you can't do these things, and here they are missing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because they were worried about going into a building or touching something that they had considered unclean. Amen? And there's a lot of people that way today is that they, they look at a group of people. They look at a group of society or, or a, a group of people and they say, oh, we can't do that because that's not what we do. You know, I, I, I want to tell you that some people, that, that if you don't wear a suit, the pastor doesn't wear a suit in church. He can't be of God. If a, if a pastor's wife doesn't have long hair, can't be of God. Amen? If, if, if you, uh, just be you, right? If you are you. And, but you've got to do all this churchy stuff. You have all these ordinances, right? You, you can't be like Hope and, and just stand up here and, and just clap and you're offbeat and, and you play with your beads and you look up and you look around, but you're in God's house with people you love. God, you see, I can't do that. You've got to be so stoic and, and archaic, right? No. That's why Jesus was so hated because the truth was there was no other way into heaven except Jesus Christ. It wasn't the temple, and that made them mad. It wasn't the services, that made them mad. It wasn't the, the rules and regulations that they had heaped upon themselves, that made them mad. And so therefore, what they did is that they had all these polluted ordinances that kept them from Jesus Christ. Jesus deals with it in Mark chapter number 7. Listen in Mark chapter number 7. It says, how be it in vain do they worship me? Teaching for doctrines, those things that the Bible says. Teaching for doctrines that the commandments of man. It says in verse number 8, it says this. For laying aside the commandment of God, doctrine, you hold the tradition of men as of the washing of pots and pans of cups and many other such things that you do. Verse number 9, Jesus says it very clearly. And Jesus said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. I'm just going to be honest with you. Every one of us has our part in our tradition. Every one of us. I, I, I want to be honest with you. I have my traditions, and you have yours. We all have these perceptions of what church should be. And we grow up with that. Maybe it's grandparents or great-grandparents and uh, family. You grow up in a, in a culture to where this is what you expect, and, and it got elevated from what you desire to what is truth, and it's really not truth. And so many people don't want to hear that. So many people want things just the way that they remember it, what, the way they want to do it, the way that they think it ought to be done. And Jesus comes in, and he just wipes that out, and he says it's not those things. It's not those things. Man, I... I want to tell you right now, we could tear this building down and go under a tree, and it shouldn't make a bit of difference to us. 
But a lot of people, a lot of people in churches throughout the land get used to what they're used to. They have a desirable truth. They make it a relative truth, and then they reject the absolute truth that Jesus is the way. You know, there's probably 3.5 billion Catholics right now that are saying, Mary, Mary, full of grace, throw the ball across the plate. I don't know what they say. Amen. Say it real loud for me. No, don't say that. It, it has something to do with spectacles and wallet. Yeah, thank you. Don't, don't go that. You teach me all these wrong things. And there's, there's right now, this is the, the month of Ramadan for Muslims. And the Muslims will be cutting themselves and they'll be going without food and all these things and they're trying to please their God. A desired truth, a relative truth, and then they push away the absolute truth. And that's what Jesus is saying that in this section here. A desired truth is blinding people. Desired truth is blinding people. That's why people can do what they do and still think that they're going to heaven. Because they have been blinded by desirable truths and relative truths, and they've missed the absolute truth. Number two, it's found in verse number 31. Uh, you, have, you have all these uh, polluted ordinances, but now you get public opinion. Look in verse 31. In verse number 31, the Bible says this, And when the morning was come, and I highlighted it in yellow on your screen, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. What does that word all mean? It means all. So there was a group of people there early in the morning. Do you know who those groups were? They were the Sanhedrin. They were the Pharisees and the scribes. There were 70 elders uh, at this trial, this mock trial, and they all had a desired truth a relative truth, and now they have expand, or they have uh, turned away from the absolute truth. Amen? It, it is that so many people do this that they don't even know that they're doing it anymore just because someone says it does not make it true. Amen? Amen? Yep, quite frankly, I believe I could preach out of the phone book or phony book. I believe that I could preach out of the Sears and Roebuck catalog in some churches. And as long as I looked a certain way, and as long as I acted a certain way, and as long as I jumped and spun a certain way, and we sung the right songs and all that, you would go out of that thinking, boy, that pastor is wonderful. If a pastor gets up and says, this is what the word of God says, it's not your desire. It's not what you think it is. It's not what, this, this doesn't matter. And I don't care what culture says, this is what Jesus said. They will hang that pastor out just like they hung Jesus. Amen? I thank God for you guys. I don't think you're going to hang me out today. But I want you to know that this is being played out all throughout Bradley County, Tennessee, America, and the world. Is that people will not come to the truth because they have believed a lie of a desirable truth, of a relative truth. And miss the absolute truth. Amen? So you've got polluted ordinances. And you've got these things that, that we know. And thirdly, is, is in verse 33, pagan officials. Now, th when I say pagan officials, read, read verse 33 and you'll get it. It says, then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. Pilate was the government. Pilate was the government. The government of Rome begin to institute things, and all they cared about was profits and peace. They wanted profits from taxation, and they wanted peace in the community. So they were willing to give the majority of the Jews what they wanted because public opinion had swayed them to a point to now where they had pagan officials saying, fine, if that's what you want, that's what we'll get. Let me tell you, America is there. Whoever is the loudest, squeakiest wheel, whoever gets more votes for whatever, that politicians get behind votes, right? They don't care about you. You have a vote. That's what they want. And so therefore, they will tell everyone what they want to hear so that they can keep their profit and their peace, right? Their position. 
And so that's where Jesus is on the side there in, in near Caiaphas' house as, as Pilate is beginning to explain to him. He said, man, there's nothing I can find wrong with you. I don't think you've done anything. And then Pilate goes out again to the Jews, and he said, I find no fault in him. And they say, but we want him to die. Pilate looks out, and he says, here's my tax base. I don't need another riot. Somebody's got to die. It's going to be Jesus. Desired, relative, and absolute. Oftentimes, your world, where, where, where's my young people at? Lauren, Kurt, you guys are going to grow up in a world that is dominated by desired truth and relative truth. And if you stand for absolute truth, you're going to be crucified. Did I say that clearly enough? In the generations to come, Vivian, you are going to see desired truth, relative truth. Do what you want to do. Uh, if that's what you want, make you happy, that's fine. But don't stand for absolute truth because absolute truth pushes away these other two. And you're going to be crucified. Relative truth is also blinding. So I have to ask you this. Verse number 37. In verse number 37, it turns. It turns back to a single individual named Pilate. Pilate was faced with a personal obligation. He had the truth in front of him. And he had to make the decision on which truth he would live by. Look what it says in verse 37. The Bible says this, Pilate therefore said unto Jesus, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Here we go. A personal obligation. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. He basically tells Pilate, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. I am the king, not only of the Jews, but the king of the universe. I am the great God of heaven who spoke into being all that you see. And Pilate, no doubt, looked at Jesus and understood what he was saying. He looks and he sees God. He looks and sees the truth. He looks and understands that Jesus is Adonijah, the master of the universe. He looks at him and says that. And then he goes back and he chooses desirable truth and relative truth. The Bible tells us this, that we all have an obligation to choose the truth. Let me give you one. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 12. says, There is therefore no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus. Philippians chapter number 2, verses number 10 and 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. In Colossians chapter number 2, in verse number 15 and 16, it says that all that was made and all that will be made was made by Jesus Christ. John, in John chapter number 1, verse number 1, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, he said this, in John 1, 14, he said, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible tells us time and time again that you have a choice of truth. Jesus is the only absolute truth. There is no other way. There is no modification. There is no uh, 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 peace treaty. There is no uh, way that you can spin it any other way than what Jesus is saying is that those who are a witness of me will hear my voice. where the world hates you. You can say what you want to say. You can do what you want to do. You can go and be what you want to be as long as you don't name the name of Jesus Christ and walk according to what he says. Because then what happens is that light pushes away the darkness and as the darkness hates light, those that are lost those that are saved. 
there's enmity, there's, there's um, a, a, a sense of, of, of battlement. That's why that Paul said in Ephesians chapter number 6, he said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of the air. He said, we wrestle against the devil and the devil's fo- uh, people. And so we're always going to be hated. So, you're going to produce something. You're going to worship something. And these people here on Golgotha have chosen to worship desirable truth, relative. And they crucify the absolute truth. Amen? So, what is your object of worship? Is it some polluted ordinance? Is it something that you think that makes you right with God? Because you do this, or you look this way, or you dress this way, or you are part of this group of people? That's why it says in Ephesians 2, 9, it says, Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not what you do. It's not what you do. I don't care how many times you kiss the Pope's ring or how many times you do that. I don't care how many church services you go to. If you do not have the absolute truth of Jesus Christ, you're living in falsehood. Amen? What about public opinion? Pastor, you shouldn't say that. Why shouldn't I say that? Can I, can I be honest with you and ask you a question? If, if it is absolute truth in God's Word, and I say it out of love, why can't I say what I want to say? Amen? I mean, let me tell you, you get on an elevator with somebody, they sure can tell you, right? Or your government can tell you, or the school system can tell you, or your work can tell you. Man, I want to tell you, DEI, diversion, or, you know, what is it? it it's brainwashing 101. You go to it, you have to, you have to click on the button. But it says that we should believe a lie so that we don't offend those that believe the lie. We are to preach the truth. And that's what Jesus is doing here, is, is that even though the government is telling him, even though public opinion tells him, even though all these polluted ordinances of the scribes and the Pharisees are telling him, Jesus is saying, I am, I am the truth. You see, your object of worship has to be the absolute truth of Jesus Christ. So as we go into this time of resurrection, I have to ask you a question. What is truth? What is your truth? And it doesn't take very long before God's word and the world become into contrast. And you have two choices with truth. One, you can stand up and speak it. Or two, you can sit down and watch it go. And we have sat down and watched it go, right? We've sat down and watched it go. Tony, come on up, get ready. Let's say it again. Vivian, learn this. Kurt, learn this. Jackson, learn this. There is a desirable truth. If you live your life in a desirable truth, you will fall into the pits of hell because the devil is a liar, a thief, and a murderer. And just because you desire something so much, you want it to be true so much, does not make it true. And if you follow a lie, if you follow the darkness, you will fall into an infinity of darkness. There's a lot of good people, moral people, who are following a desirable truth, but they're going to die and go to hell. And then there's a relative. Just because the public opinion, just because culture, just because the government tells us as a group that it's okay to do these things, no. Why? Because there is only one absolute truth. And that is Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ has given us his word to where we would know how to walk in these evil days. In these evil days. And so, I suppose we have to come to a point. Do you believe in absolute truth? Do you believe in absolute truth in Jesus Christ? Would you stand to your feet, bow your head?
Father, we come to you today, and Father, we thank you for your word, who speaks truth to us. Your word is true, O Lord, forever established in heaven. And God, I pray, Father, today, as we as a church, as we go out into this polluted world, this pagan world, this world uh, of, of just relative truth, I pray we be able to speak absolute truth. Now, Father, go with us, watch over us, and keep us. And God, we give you the glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen to Tony as he sings. You know, everybody can just kind of sing this just amazing grace. There's no greater truth than the grace Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Sing. sing it with us. Well, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me And I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see It was grace that taught Grace. 